the Austrian tradition was virtually dead. Uh, and, and once again, I can remind you that in 1952, when I came to, uh, to Mises, uh, it was an embarrassment to have to confess that one was associated with, with the Austrian school. Uh, I remember my dissertation defense in 1957. I was asked, do you mean to say that you subscribe to Austrian ideas? And I said, yes. And uh, <laughs> I thought that was the end of it. <laughs> but, uh, well, in, in 1952, certainly, certainly, the Austrian tradition was considered to be to be uh, Marbon completely. Now, in 1932, a statement was made by Mises, which I still find amazing. That statement was that today all modern schools of economic theory are saying virtually the same thing. The differences that separate us are matters of exposition, language, style, technique, not substance. That was in 1932. In 1952, just 20 years, 20 years later, I can assure you that 20 years is nothing. It may seem a long time, but I can assure you 20 years is nothing. 20 years later, when I came to study under Mises, the idea that Austrian economics was uh, part of the mainstream was, would, have been, would have been ridiculous. The, the climate in Mises' seminar was we are here, a minority, a beleaguered, rejected, disdained minority approach, which is totally different from what's being taught in the mainstream uh, seminars. And there's no question that that, that was correct. So what happened in those 20 years? In 1932, all modern schools. Remember, what, the, what were the modern schools in 1932? Marshallian economics, dominant in Britain, Austrians, Walrasians, okay? Institutionalists? Well, Mises didn't mean, didn't mean that. Okay. So all modern schools of theory were saying the same thing. To understand that difference, I think, is to understand what has happened between the late 1930s and, and the 1950s. In 1932, Mises was celebrating the defeat of the German historical school, whom we've mentioned before. The German historical school was in the dustbin of intellectual history by 1932. And that's what Mises meant. We're all theorists. The German historical school is discredited. By 1952, Mises was well aware that all the different schools were not saying the same thing. And I believe that what happened in between 1932 and 1952 was the socialist calculation debate of the late, of the mid and late 30s. That debate, in my view, taught Mises that there was a profound difference between the economic <coughs> theory of the mainstream and the economic theory of the Austrian tradition. That was 1952. Now, 1952, I, I take 1952 as a, as a self-centered perspective. That's when I first met, met Mises. But three years earlier, 1949, Mises published his Human Action his magisterial treatise, Human Action. In the same year, Hayek published a smaller book entitled Individualism and Economic Order. The, both books had roots in the preceding decade. Mises' Human Action was originally published in his German version with some modifications. There were, that is, there were later modifications from the German version, who had published the Nationale Economie of 1940, published in Geneva. It's one of the greatest books with, which was ignored, thoroughly ignored, it was published during the war, it was published 
It was published in, in, in Europe uh, at a time when uh, there was no way in which that book could make its impact. It was published in German. There was had no way in which it could make that book could make its impact on, on uh, English language economics until the 1949 uh, version was published. Hayek's uh, Individualism and Economic Order contained papers that were published from beginning 1937. Well, there were earlier papers as well, but the ones that I'm focusing on are they began in 1937 uh, through the early and mid-40s. And as I indicated earlier, these two books constituted dramatic advances in Austrian understanding, dramatic advances in the Austrian theory, in the Austrian approach. Now, I, I can't, I can't overemphasize the dramatic quality of this. The professional reputation of the, of the Austrian school was down there, down there, the pits in the late 1940s. The German, the, the uh, Austrian school was considered to have been dead, a, a, a matter of history footnote to history. The groups in Vienna had dispersed. Uh, it was perceived that Hayek had been defeated in doctrinal debates with Keynes, with uh, Schraffer. Uh, it, was cons it was perceived that the Austrians, Mises and Hayek, had been defeated in, with regard to socialist calculation debate. We'll have more to say about that. It was perceived that uh, Hayek had been defeated in his debate with Frank Knight, who was a great American economist regarding capital theory. So by the late 1930s, Austrian economics was considered to have been finished, dead. Tradition was gone. Precisely at that time, when Austrian economics was way down there, you had a dramatic increase in the level of economic understanding represented by uh, these Austrian uh, economists, these great Austrian economists. What was it that Mises and Hayek brought to, to economics that didn't exist before? Let us remember, uh, Mises by 1940 was a well-established, world-famous economist. He had published his first book in 1912, the theory of, they translated the theory of money and credit. He had published his uh, his, perhaps his most famous book of 1922, uh, Das Gemeinwirtschaft, uh, later translated as Socialism. Uh, he, he published uh, National Economy. He published in 1933, he published uh, the Grund Problema, later translated as Epistemological Problems in Economics. So he was a well known, world famous uh, economist by the 1940s. So when someone in his 60s writes a treatise, you don't generally think that there's going to be, there's going to be path breaking. But it was, and, and I'll try and show how it was. Hayek was also a world famous economist. He was born in 1899. Uh, he, was, he had never been a formal student of, of Mises, but he had become a, uh, a, a, a disciple, in a way, of Mises in the 1920s. And Hayek has written that I've learned more from Mises than I have of any other human being, any other person. He learned more from Mises. The relationship between Hayek and Mises is a complicated one. I won't, I won't try and, and uh, parse that relationship, but certainly uh, Hayek recognized that his own intellectual development owed an enormous debt uh, to, to Mises. Uh, the Austrian theory of the trade cycle, which Hayek developed, was a development of, of core ideas developed in a few pages in Mises' 1912 uh, theory of money and, and credit. By the 1930s, uh, Hayek, as I mentioned earlier, had become uh, the leading figure in British economics. He'd taken the position, he took chair in, in uh, London. But in the 1930s, the socialist calculation debate occurred. And it is my thesis that the socialist calculation debate taught Mises and taught Hayek that they have to restate, re-articulate the theory which they had understood all along, but which had not been made explicit. 
this was the advances that they made in 1949, uh, human action and individualism and economic order. What happened in the socialist calculation debate? Well, uh, Mises, and later on Hayek, had argued that a centrally planned economy uh, could not plan centrally. A planning authority, with all the will in the world, with all the resources at its disposal, would not be able to allocate society's resources in the way in which it wishes to allocate them. Would not be able to do so because it would not have at its disposal the knowledge necessary to make the calculations that would be required in order to uh, balance the different uh, demands for resources. Which means that the, the uh, way in which resources would be allocated in a centrally planned economy would be haphazard. They would not be following any rational plan. Might, there might be an attempt to make a rational plan, but no rational plan could be, in fact, pursued. The, the uh, debate was with a number of well-trained socialist economists, particularly in Great Britain, who argued that the problem which Mises had raised was a valid problem, that it needed to be addressed, that it could be addressed, and that the problem could be solved. The, uh, the most important contribution on the socialist side was the contribution of, of uh, Oscar Lange, Polish economist, and of Abba Lerner, who had been a student of, of Hayek's in London, they both put forward, they, they both offered a theory, they both offered a suggested solution that would explain how a central planning authority could use socialist prices, quote unquote, could use non-market prices with which to calculate. And they were, in so doing, they were deploying standard microeconomic theory. As someone once said, the economics of socialism is capitalist price theory. That is to say, the theory of how a socialist economy might work, as Lange and Lerner believed it could work, was based on the microeconomic theory which explains how prices are determined in a market economy in standard neoclassical economics. What, what Mises and Hayek realized was that the, that the problem was that they, the neoclassical price theory, the neoclassical microeconomic theory was itself flawed was itself was itself subject to errors. There were there were limitations on standard micro theory that were responsible for the way in which the socialist economists perfectly consistently were simply deploying standard price theory to explain how uh, a non-price system could work, a non-market price system could work, and. What they were doing, whereas what Mises and Hayek were doing in the decade beginning, say, 1936, was to explore the sense, was to explore the sense in which it is simply wrong and mistaken to believe that the price system of neoclassical price theory in any way captures the essence of of uh, what happens in a capitalist market. So let me try and, and develop this uh, in, greater, in greater detail. The standard price theory operates, as we indicated earlier uh, this morning, without creativity and without recognizing the unknowability of the, or an indeterminacy of the future. 
it operates by assuming that decisions are made between given alternatives. You're given a platter in which you have alternatives. You have your ranking of preferences. Well, you deploy your ranking of preferences against the background of the given alternatives, and you choose the, that which is best. Simple. The entire price system is seen as an array of decisions which simultaneously satisfy that picture of the decision. That is, I'm making my decisions now based on the options that are in front of me. You, each one of you, are making your decisions now on the basis of the decisions that are respectively put before you. And this is true of every individual in the entire system. And that's the explanation for prices. Prices will be those prices which will permit all of these decisions to be made simultaneously. This is the basis of what well, raising general equilibrium theory. The idea that, that one has a series of decisions, all of which fit with each other. And the beauty of a price system is understood to be the beauty of the interlocking decisions that, that are, permit each other to, to be carried out. But notice now, if that's what a market is, where you have millions of interlocking decisions, where each decision is made between alternatives that are made available by the decisions of others. In other words, my options, what's on my planner? Uh, my planner are the options which are created by your decision. And your decision is created by your decision among the alternatives which are presented by my decision as well as other people's decisions. So all of these decisions interlock. Now, what makes them interlock? Why does, why does everything fit in so well? What is it that makes them fit in so well? Let's consider the alternatives. Either they are all correct or not. If they are all correct, in other words, my anticipations of your decisions correctly anticipate your decisions, and your decisions correctly anticipate my decisions. And that's what makes them all interlock, because we correctly anticipate each decision, each other's decisions. If that is the case, then we have started out our analysis with the assumption that everything already fits in. That doesn't explain how it comes to fit in. Isn't it remarkable? Isn't it one of the great mysteries, the great wonders of the market that everything fits in, to the degree that it does fit in? But if we start out with the assumption that everything does fit in, we are begging the question. We are starting our problem by looking at the answer book. We've assumed that everything fits in. We are not explaining how the market might generate interlocking decisions that do fit in. We're simply assuming that they fit in. Or to put it in slightly more technical language, what are we assuming? We are assuming equilibrium from the very beginning. We are not explaining how equilibrium might possibly be attained, if it, if it is attained. We are not explaining how equilibrating movements can be set in motion. We are simply assuming that equilibrium already exists. So that doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound intellectually honest. It doesn't sound intellectually honest to say the, that the theory of prices in a market is explained by the assumption that everything already fits. Which is what neoclassical microeconomics, basically what Raisian economics really does. It starts out with the assumption that everything fits. In fact, I may, as a footnote, point out that advanced mathematical economists have, over the past, over the past uh, three or four decades, tried to grapple with the possibilities of how you could set up a mathematics where the initial decisions don't fit in, and they basically have failed. They have failed to be able to generate a mathematical process by which mistakes can be, can be correct. So, to start out by assuming that everything is correct in the, in the first instance is to make the question. What's the other alternative? The other alternative is to assume, is to assume that, the, uh, that some of the decisions are mistaken. In other words, I make my decision based on your, uh, my anticipation that you're going to make a decision which you do not make. So I go out uh, with a bunch of newspapers under my arm trying to sell newspapers and you have no intention to buy newspapers. I, I, I bought the newspapers 
at wholesale, intending to sell them, uh, expecting you to buy them, and you don't buy them. All right? So it's a mistake. What happens now? What happens now? There is nothing in the Rabinzian world which indicates what I'm going to do next. There is nothing in the Rabinzian world, I say by Rabinzian world I mean the world of static subjectivism, or, or neoclassical subjectivism, or neoclassical decision making, which indicates how I will revise my, my decisions based on my market experience. There is nothing in the system itself, in the set of assumptions that sets up neoclassical economics, there is nothing that indicates how revisions will take place in, in decisions. This is the impasse, if you will, uh, with respect to the price theory, which was the intellectual basis of the socialist defense of the possibility of calculation, sensible calculation under socialism in the 1930s. And what Mises and Hayek both did was to articulate a price theory, was to articulate an approach to price theory which solves these problems that we have with that we have identified. Let me take them one at a time. I'll start we'll start with Hayek. It was Hayek who first pointed out that what we mean by economic equilibrium is complete mutual knowledge. But let me just illustrate that by, by using a very, a very uh, stylized example. Everybody knows the supply and demand curve, right? You've got your demand curve, you've got your supply curve. And everybody knows, if you learn that in freshman economics, that this is going to be an equilibrium price. What do you mean by that's going to be the equilibrium price? What, what does you mean by that? Why should the price, if this is 10, why should the price be 10? Why isn't it 12? Well, it can't be 12, because if it was 12, right, there'd be a greater supply, then there would be demand. That would force price down. It can't be less than 10, it can't be, can't be 5, because then in that case, there'd be a greater demand than supply, that would force price up. But hold on now. Hold on now. What are you assuming? You assumed, when, in your neoclassical approach, you assumed that everybody, everybody's making the right decisions. You're assuming that that you face markets in which you can buy and sell as much as you want at the going market price. It was Hayek who pointed out that, that, that to postulate price being at 10, you are postulating that everybody knows every, every, everything else. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And that's the meaning of the equilibrium. And there's nothing wrong with talking about equilibrium as a theoretical construct. It is the state of the market in which everybody's decisions correctly anticipate all other decisions. That's the meaning of equilibrium. And disequilibrium, in Hayek's uh, interpretation, refers to the situation where people do not know correctly what other people are doing. So for example, if the market price were five, that would mean that, that the people who, who offered to pay only five mistakenly believe that they can get all they want at the, at the price of five. They don't know that at the price of five, there'll be a, a, there'll be a smaller quantity being offered for sale. They don't know that. Now, this interpretation of equilibrium as, as constituting a set of affairs where everybody has perfect knowledge of each other was Hayek's contribution. And Hayek had the further contribution, the further insight, which he developed in those papers that were republished in Individualism, individualism and economic order, he had the further insight that the market process is a process of learning. Now, nobody ever said that before. That the market process is a process of learning. That's the essence of a market. A market is a process of learning. Now, in Walrasian economics, in Marshallian equilibrium economics, markets are simply, uh, are simply uh, uh, arenas in which equilibrium somehow is, is, is attained. How is it attained? According to Hayek, it's attained through a process of learning. Emphasis on knowledge. Now, it, it would be incorrect to say that nobody had ever used the word knowledge before. But, but 
it was Hayek who first focused the profession's attention on the role of knowledge, the role of learning in market interaction. That's an extension of subjectivism because static subjectivism is consistent with the possibility that everybody knows everything they're supposed to know. So much for knowledge, right? Let, let me turn to Mises now. Mises he talks about choice. And as I indicated before, microeconomics is all about choice. Methodological individualism is all about choice, all about decision. But as we pointed out earlier, the notion of decision in the earlier context was a notion where the decision is purely mathematical. Where if you give me the data, I'll tell you what you've decided. Feed into the computer what your rankings, what your rankings are. Feed into the computer what your resource constraints are. And the, math and the, and the, the, the computer will figure out the best, the, the best uh, choice available to you. And that's what you're going to do. Obviously, you're going to take the best choice. The best choice is a matter of mathematical calculation. That's all there is to it. Decision is mathematics. Optimization, constrained optimization. Constrained maximization. Mises had a, had a notion of choice which, was, which incorporated those elements that we related before to shadow. Remember what those that what those features were, creativity and futurity, the recognition that you're facing an uncertain future. The future is uncertain. You don't know what's on the platter in front of you. If you go to medical school, you don't know exactly how you're going to enjoy or not enjoy your, your stint at that house. You don't know exactly what, will, what your marriage will turn out to be. You don't know what, what the, the, the market for, for legal services will be in 20 years. You don't know these things. When you make any business decision, the difference between a good decision and a bad decision is not a difference in mathematics. It's a difference in foresight. It's a difference in, in your ability to recognize what's around the corner. It's a difference between the ability to recognize what's going to happen in six months' time. That's not a matter of mathematics. That's a matter of foresight. That's a matter of seeing in the future recognizing what's going to happen. That is what Mises incorporated in his notion of choice. He called it human action. Human action involves an element that goes beyond constrained maximization. Human action involves an element of creativity and an element of facing the, the indeterminate future and making a stab at the future. Let's be honest with ourselves. We make stabs at the future every moment of our lives. We live, in a, we live in a world in which we have to do that. You can't make decisions confined exclusively to given options. The idea that everything is on a platter in front of you, you just choose between objectively available uh, options, it is an illusion is an illusion. Even if you are literally given a planet, you don't know. Maybe, that maybe there's a bomb in one of those things. You don't know. You didn't think about that, that there might be an explosive in any one of them, but you don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know about the future. There's a lot of things we don't know about what looks like the present. So every time we step on a bus, every time we step out of our houses, every time, every time we enter our houses, we are making a decision in the face of, of an unknown future. Now, we don't get paranoid about it. We <coughs> often take for granted that the future will be pretty much like the past. Or at any rate, we have a fairly, a fairly clear idea of what we think the future is going to help on. But the, there is always an ineradicable element of indeterminacy in the future, and there is always an ineradicable element of indeterminacy among the options from among which we are able to choose. And that's implied in the notion of human faction, which goes beyond what I would call Rabinzian choice. 
It means that when I make an, an, a decision, I am at that moment in time, I am identifying for myself what I think the options are. So it's not a choice between op options that are presented to me before I make my choice. It's a decision which determines what the options are. And this, I call this element, this additional element in, in human action that's over and above the, the, the Vintian choice, I call that the entrepreneurial element. Entrepreneurial element in human action. Mises himself writes, in every single human decision, there is an entrepreneurial element. Uh, this is what he means. We are all entrepreneurs. That is, we are all making decisions that depend on our, our own identification of what the alternatives are. If you put together the, the Hayekian insights on knowledge and learning and the Misesian insights on entrepreneurial element, you will begin to feel an understanding of market processes that goes far beyond neoclassical microeconomic theory, in my job. You will begin to understand that markets are arenas in which entrepreneurial activity is driving the system. Let me just illustrate uh, how sharply different this, this understanding is of the market from a standard neoclassical uh, theory. You probably know what competition is. You probably remember from your undergraduate textbooks that competition is described as a system which, if it's perfect, involves innumerable or infinite numbers of buyers and sellers, all of which, all of whom know, have perfect knowledge about the conditions of the market. Now let's take that together. Perfect knowledge, infinite number of buyers and sellers. That's competition. This, let, me, let, me, let me go back 50 years to the, the days in which I was sitting in Mises' seminar twice a week. That is, of course, in the seminar that he gave twice a week. And another night of the week, I was sitting in the, in the standard neoclassical price theory course. I was totally confused, totally confused. It took me years to straighten things out. Because it seemed that the word competition in my neoclassical price theory course was used in precisely the opposite sense of the meaning of the word competition in the Mises courses. Exactly the opposite. What was described here as competition was described here as the absence of competition. Now, how is that? very simple. The competition that you and I know in the real world is a competition where you don't have perfect knowledge, where competition consists of an entrepreneurial leap in the dark, where you figure you may be able to get more customers by lowering your price. That's not competition in the textbooks. Competition in the textbooks is where you can change the price. The market is in equilibrium at the going price. Everybody knows everything. Competition is described as a, sense of, as a state of affairs where, where everybody's at the finishing line, uh, neck and neck. There's no, there's no way in which you can, you can out-compete anybody else in a perfectly competitive world. Everybody's doing exactly the same thing. That's not what competition means in everyday life. That's not what competition means in business. That's not what competition means in athletics. It's not what competition means in academics. The competition in all of these areas, in all of these arenas, means competition to choose a course of action which you believe will put you ahead of your competitors. You may be wrong, but so long as there is room for entrepreneurial discovery, there is room for dynamic competition. It was in the it was in the papers in Hayek's Individualism and Economic Order where that notion of competition became articulated. It was, I believe, the first time in modern economics 
that people began to understand that competition is a dynamic process, a process of competition, not a state of affairs. That is the result of the insights of, of understanding that markets are processes of learning. Competition is the process of discovery. That's the title of, of one of Hayek's papers. Competition is a discovery process. Competition is a, is, a, is a process by which we learn about that which we didn't know before. We make mistakes, but how do we learn to correct them? Competition. Competition teaches you things. The other guy's competition taught you that you can charge a lower price and get away with it. Or you can charge a higher price and get away with it. Competition teaches you that there is a new way of doing things. Each of those competitive steps is an entrepreneurial step. That is, it's a step which jumps out of the box. It's a step which, which recognizes that the choices which I thought were in front of me, the options that I thought were in front of me, were either not in front of me at all, or were not necessarily the best that I could have, I could have uh, selected. Which means that I have to create those opportunities. That's where creativity comes. That's entrepreneurship. And when you understand the market as a process of entrepreneurship, then you begin to understand, then you begin to understand how prices are really determined in markets. And you begin to understand what Mises meant when he said that, when he used to laugh at the idea that socialist planners could have non-market prices as their guides. What do you mean by a non-market price? A price is that which emerges as a result of competitive entrepreneurial guesses. Under a centrally planned uh, system, there are no entrepreneurs, there are no guesses by entrepreneurial competition. Those are not prices at all. You can call whatever you want, but those are not, have nothing to do with market prices. They have nothing to do with the, with the learning process, which is the essence of the, of the, uh, of the capitalist market. So this, these contributions by Mises and Hayek in the late, in the late 1940s constituted, in my estimate, advances in subjectivism. The subjectivism of the early Austrians have been confined to the subjectivism of preferences, the subjectivism of tastes. What comes out from Mises and Hayek was an extension of subjectivism, meaning that explanations are now understood to reflect the entrepreneurial decisions of human beings who make human choices, which are creative, which are made in the teeth of indeterminacy, radical indeterminacy of the future. But let me try and, and develop very briefly here what I see as, as another dramatic uh, element in, in the Mises and Hayek contributions. Remember, we, we had Shackles' name on the board earlier, the first lecture. And I pointed out that Shackles saw creativity and indeterminacy as meaning that every moment is a new beginning, which meant, which seems to me, that there is no historical continuity. Every moment is a new beginning. And that made me profoundly uncomfortable. I think it makes everybody uncomfortable. To really believe that, the, that every moment in history is disconnected with what came before. That there are, there are no cause, chains of causation that link different points of time. It makes me profoundly uncomfortable. What happens, what happened in the Misesian Hayek view of the entrepreneurial market process is that all the systematic features of markets, all the laws of economics, if you will, the supply and the law of supply and demand, the idea that there are forces that push us towards this intersection point. There are forces. I believe there are. What drives those forces are, is precisely the creativity of choice and the indeterminacy of the future within which people make the choices. You know, uh, I mentioned the name Frank Knight uh, earlier today uh, in a different context, in the context of his, 
a debate with Hayek on capital theory. But Frank Knight, a great, great American economist, the, the, uh, uh, the, the founder, if you will, of, of the Chicago School of Economics, the teacher of, of Milton Friedman and George Stiegler, and, and that, that very important school of American economists, uh, highly sympathetic to free markets and so forth. There's only non Austrians. Knight, Knight, uh, in his 1921 book called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, Knight articulated the meaning of uncertainty as opposed to risk. Risk is something that uh, is subject to the law of large numbers. You can, you can play the odds. Uncertainty is something which is not subject to odds. You can lay odds, but, 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 but there's nothing, there's, there is no, there is no uh, laws of probability that govern uh, the outcome of uh, that which is uncertain. You can't predict uh, who's going to, whether the Yankees are going to win tonight's game with the, with, with, uh, with the Blue Jays. You can't, you, can't, you can't predict that in the sense of saying, well, uh, out of, out of uh, 1,500 tries, uh, the, 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 there's going to be for sure 700 this way and 800 that way. It doesn't work that way. That's uncertainty. Not subject to the laws of probability. Knight made it seem as if action in an uncertain world is haphazard. You know, the cookie could crumble this way, the cookie could crumble that way. Mises, I believe, was able to show that entrepreneurs have a tendency, and let's be very careful here, they have a tendency to notice that which it is in their interest to notice. Entrepreneurs go for profitable opportunities. Profitable opportunities, remember, are not that which is put on a platter. If you do this, you get a lump of profit. Well, I want profit, so I'm going to go, 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 go do that. That offers me more profit, so I'll do that. It's not that way at all. Profit is a result of entrepreneurial decision-making in a world which is not on a platter. Profit is something which you win by anticipating that which is going to happen. Creatively, in the, in the teeth of uncertainty, in the teeth of indeterminacy. But there is a tendency for entrepreneurs, entrepren for entrepreneurship to see around the corner. It's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. But there is such a tendency. Not everybody has, has the same entrepreneurial talent as everybody else. We're all entrepreneurs to a, to an extent. But some stay teachers. Uh, some make millions and millions. But we're all entrepreneurs. But there is a tendency for those with a sharper nose for entrepreneurial profits to smell those profits. And the laws of economics, if I may use that phrase in quotes, the laws of economics are laws which result from entrepreneurial decision making. And they're laws. Now that, that, that takes shackle and turns it on its head. It takes shackles in determinacy, shackles creativity, and say that that's that doesn't generate a world in which every moment is a new beginning. That generates a world in which we can understand systematic market processes of entrepreneurial competition. That is the meaning of the, uh, the advance of Mises and Hayek uh, to the dynamic subjective. And I believe that if you put all of this together, you will arrive at a picture which takes the glyphs the GVN, the glyphs by Manga. It takes that glyphs and articulates it into a full-fledged, fully-fledged uh, theory and understanding of, of market phenomena. Because you begin to realize that Manga was absolutely right. What determines economic activity, what determines economic values, what determines the allocation of resources, what determines the structure of production, everything is human beings. Human beings, through their preferences, yes, but that was understood by the, the Austrians of the 1920s. But by human beings, in terms of their entrepreneurial recognition, mutual recognition of what consumers want, what consumers will want in five years' time. The entrepreneur who builds an ice cream factory now 
He's building an ice cream factory to satisfy the desires of unborn kids who will be around in 10 years' time and will be bothering their mothers for ice cream. And that's, and that's, that's entrepreneurial anticipation. Okay. And the world lives on the, that basis. The world hangs together on the basis of these entrepreneurial, comp entrepreneurially competitive decisions. So that uh, you have a, a perspective of explanation which roots uh, the, the systematic causes that take place, systematic chains of causation that take place in a, in a market economy to the, uh, to the human beings and their decisions. That's, the, uh, that's carrying uh, Menger's subjectivism to its fully articulated and completed, uh, completed picture. Let me, in the few minutes that I have left, uh, try and show very briefly how, as a result of the contributions of Mises and of Hayek in the 1940s, which I, I, I can't, I can't uh, avoid getting excited each time I recognize the drama involved in the, in the appearance of these works at the time when Austrian economics was downloaded. Let me try and show how, in turn, these contributions have generated uh, a uh, remarkable resurgence of interest in the Austrian tradition, a remarkable interest of rediscovery, if you will, of the insights of Menger. More people have read Menger in the past 30 years, I believe, than read Menger ever before. Menger's book was never, was never translated until 1950. Then it was translated with, a, with an introductory essay by Knight, which was so critical, was so negative about Menger, that, that, that I don't know how anybody would bother to read the book after reading the introduction. <coughs> and yet, when you read that book, as I believe Hayek and Robbins and others have pointed out, it reads so fresh. Menger's book of 1871 reads so fresh and so exciting. You, 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 it, and so persuasive that uh, one, one uh, is stimulated to uh, further economic understanding. You see, if I can digress for a moment, Knight never understood Menger's law. That picture that I had earlier with the direction, the, the arrow going up versus the arrow going down, Knight never understood that. Never understood that. You probably remember, this is all, all part of the footnote, you may remember in your, in your undergraduate textbooks uh, the circular flow diagram, remember that? Knight was the author of that diagram in a little book called Economic Organization that was sort of notes that he used to circulate among his classes. And in that circular diagram, consumers and producers Consumers provide labor services to producers. Producers produce goods that are consumed by consumers. It goes round and round and round. It never stops. You know, you know the picture that, that that represents? That represents a picture. You see somebody eating breakfast. Why are you eating breakfast? Oh, I've got to go to work. And why do you want to go to work? Oh, because I have to get my income. And why exactly do you need your income? Oh, how am I going to pay for my breakfast tomorrow if I don't get income? So the reason why I have breakfast is to get income. The reason why I have income is to get breakfast. The reason why I have, I have breakfast is to have income. What's the point of it? What is the point of it? This is a circular flow that goes round and round and round. The Austrians understood. This was Menger's insight. That you want breakfast because you want to eat. Not because you want to, you want to go to work. You may have to go to work too. So part of that breakfast is to go to work. But if the only reason why you ate breakfast was to go to work in order to eat, to, 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 to eat breakfast, you want to consume. It's the consumer's decisions and preferences which are the ultimate beginning. They are the, uh, they're taken from the outside. They're not part of a circular flow. That's why Knight could never could understand Menger's book. When you read Knight's introduction, please remember that. But I digress. I promise I will try and give you a brief idea as to some of the, uh, the activity that's, that's happening, uh, that's been happening since, uh, since the, the late 40s when Mises and Hayek uh, were presenting their, 
their very ignored contributions. Mises in, at New York University had a seminar. It was nowhere near the stature of the seminar that he had had, the Provost seminar that he had in Vienna that we mentioned earlier. But there were some, some uh, important individuals. Uh, Murray Rothbard was a member of that seminar. George Reisman, uh, Percy and Bettina Greaves, uh, Hans Senholz. These were important contrib contributors to the subsequent revival of the Greaves thing. In 1974, there was a uh, conference at South Royalton. You don't know where South Royalton is? Neither did I. South Royalton is a small, uh, a small village up in New England. And there was a conference in 1974. And let me tell you, I was at a meeting, an organizational meeting, where there was some discussion. Should we call this a conference on Austrian economics or not? And it was decided, well, let's call it Austrian economics. But there was a strong, a strong possibility that it might never have been called Austrian economics. But it was called a, a seminar on Austrian economics, a conference on Austrian economics. And at that, at that conference, uh, there were three lecturers. There was Murray Rothbard, there was uh, uh, Ludwig Blachmann, and myself. We were the three lecturers. And uh, at that, at that uh, conference, we had a number of, of, of younger scholars who have subsequently uh, become uh, extremely important in the subsequent development of Austrian economics. Uh, uh, President Richard Ebeling was there, um, Maria Riza was there, uh, Roger Garrison was there, uh, Joe Salerno was there. Uh, these are some of the names, and some of them you'll be, you'll be hearing this week. Uh, these, were, these were young scholars at the time who somehow sensed, I think this is an entrepreneurial element in, in scholarship, they smelt the validity of Austrian economics in spite of its unpopularity, in spite of its unfashionability. They had an, un an intellectual entrepreneurial talent. Okay? And this led, uh, this led to further development. I, I, I believe one should recognize there were foundations that had a, that played a role in, uh, in advancing uh, the institutional uh, developments that were necessary. Uh, subsequent years, they became, they became centers of Austrian uh, scholarship. Uh, my own New York University was, uh, was uh, for a long time a, a pioneer. Uh, later on, George Mason University became an important uh, location. Auburn University, University of Nevada, where Murray Rothbard uh, and others were teaching and are teaching, Hillsdale College uh, became a, an important uh, location for Austrian economics and for the publication of, of Austrian uh, Austrian works. Uh, there have there have been uh, the development of journals. We have Austrian journals of economics. There is a society for the development of Austrian economics, a professional society which holds annual meetings. So we've had some of the uh, of the frills of uh, professional life have uh, become associated with Austrian economics, which didn't exist uh, 50 years ago. 50 years ago, nobody believed there would ever be a journal of Austrian economics of any kind. Nobody believed there would be a professional society of Austrian economics. Nobody, nobody believed there would be students coming to doctoral programs only because they would be able to study uh, Austrian economics. Uh, it would be a mistake to present the development of Austrian economics uh, since Mises and Hayek as a, uh, as a consistent onward, upward, uh, movement, intellectual movement of uh, happily cooperating scholars. There have been all kinds of, of fights and all kinds of disagreements and all kinds of, of schisms uh, in the course of these, of these years. Uh, maybe someone will write a doctoral dissertation on some of these uh, parts of history, economic, history of economic thought, history of Austrian economic thought. But the broad picture, the big picture, as I look back and I see it, is that the contributions of Mises and Hayek inspired the younger generation. They inspired the younger generation to, uh, to uh, rebel, if you will, against an orthodoxy which seemed to ignore 
such things as creativity, seems to ignore such things as entrepreneurship, seems to ignore such uh, insights as, uh, as dynamic uh, competition, uh, seem, to, seem to ignore the, uh, the possibility of a purely subjectivist uh, approach. Now, it would be disingenuous of me to ignore totally the ideological component in Austrian economics. Uh, I insist, and I continue to insist, that ideology and intellectual uh, integrity uh, do not, need not, and should not contradict each other. In other words, you can be, you can be in favor of socialism and still be a good Austrian economist, in theory. You can be, you can be uh, a, 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 a um, in favor of capitalism, be, be in favor of classical liberalism, and be a non-Austrian. All of that is possible, I think, honestly. I think that is an honest person may, may, may have, uh, may, may be an Austrian at the same time as, as not pursuing a classical liberal, liberal position. For Mises himself, and perhaps for some others, the uh, linkage between Austrian insights and classical liberalism is closer than it would be for others. My own position is that these are intellectually separable uh, elements. Okay? But it would be disingenuous to make it appear that uh, classical liberalism is, is not associated with Austrian economics, or more accurately, that Austrian economics is not associated with classical liberal liberalism. Uh, there certainly has been a very uh, close relationship between the pure economics and pure intellectual developments which I've tried to focus on this morning, on the one hand, and the ideological commitment to classical liberal ideas on the other. There is a relationship. Uh, it's not a necessary relationship, it's certainly not a sufficient relationship, but there is a relationship. I think I will stop here and give you a chance to raise some more questions. I think the sum total of what we have is, I hope, a fulfillment of, the, uh, of, of my promise at the beginning of uh, the first lecture to try and give you a survey of the development of subjectivist explanation in economics, uh, insofar as it is re represented by uh, the Austrian tradition. Uh, we have seen that this uh, development occurred in two stages, an earlier stage uh, leading up to the period of 1930s, during which there was a dramatic convergence among all modern schools, followed by a second period uh, in which the divergence between modern schools became apparent, the rifts became apparent, became articulated at the same time as the Austrian tradition itself became advanced through the works of Mises and Hayek. Thank you very much. Second lecture, I had uh, I had I had a uh, reference to this debate. Uh, there simply was not enough time to, to go into it. Uh, you are referring to uh, a debate that has one of the I mentioned schisms within within the Austrian tradition. One of those uh, divisions is between uh, a, a group of scholars following uh, Joe Salerno and Mario Rothbard, the late Mario Rothbard who insisted on uh, a, a sharp difference between Mises and Hayek, particularly with respect to socialist calculation. Uh, they have argued against uh, the approach I've taken this morning. I've taken this uh, an approach this morning that emphasizes the complementarity between Mises and Hayek. I think I did recognize that uh, Hayek uh, focused on knowledge, Mises focused on 
on the entrepreneurial element, or the entrepreneurial character of the market, uh, but I've treated these as complement complementary to each other. Uh, the Professor Salerno and the late uh, Professor Rothbard, uh, they uh, developed a thesis that uh, Mises and Hayek uh, articulated two contrasting paradigms. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. They believed that uh, Hayek's uh, perspective was uh, is somehow less Austrian than that of Mises. Uh, and uh, one of the implications was how to read their interpretation, their positions in the uh, socialist calculation debate. I argue that Mises and Hayek certainly were different thinkers. You don't expect thinkers of the stature of, of, of a Mises or of a Hayek to be, to be uh, parroting each other. It, it's, it's, you couldn't expect that. There are sharp differences. Uh, you mentioned a priorism. Uh, that's one of the very important methodological differences, if you will, between Hayek and, uh, and Mises. Mises was an a priorist. He believed that the laws of economics uh, are laws of logic, laws which can be which can be developed by uh, by introspective uh, thought, introspective logic. Uh, Hayek believed that ultimately the learning processes, which we talked about, those learning processes cannot be predicted a priori; they are matters of, of, of learning. Uh, Hayek emphasized dispersed knowledge. And you will not find uh, explicit reference to that in, in Mises. So th these are the bases for uh, the position that there are sharp differences between the two, uh, particularly, but not, uh, not exclusively confined to the socialist calculation debate. Uh, my own position is that uh, not only is there complementarity between Mises and Hayek, but also they share the same overall understanding of the market as a dynamically competitive process. I remember I once gave a lecture in the presence of Hayek. It was at Freiburg, where he, he went uh, after Chicago. Um, and I gave that lecture. I gave a lecture, and I developed the entrepreneurial perspective, which I associated with Mises. And Hayek uh, got up after the lecture, and he made a few remarks. And he said, as I recall, he said, well, Kersner emphasizes entrepreneurship. And that's OK. That's OK. As he was saying, that's not the way I would have put it. But he has no quarrel with it. With it. Uh, I think he was right. I think the entrepreneurial perspective is another way of articulating the dynamically competitive uh, perspective, which Hayek, which Hayek himself uh, stated. So, um, as I say, my position, uh, unlike uh, Salerno and Rothbard, is that it is a mistake uh, to draw a sharp line of division between Mises and Hayek. It's not only a mistake, I think it's a strategic disaster for Austrian economics to say we've got two paradigms and that uh, and that Hayek was, was not really an Austrian or something like that. Uh, that's, I think, most unfortunate. And, and I think that should be, that should be resisted. And I have resisted myself. Okay. This, I'm just wondering how you see the future. I mean, I know you're talking about the journals and the conferences and stuff, but how you see the future of Austrian economics and how um, students like us can keep from what, ha what happened in the 30s from happening again down the road, if there's a, you think a division like this Mises Hayek thing might cause another problem like that, or? Well, I think, it's, I think that's unfortunate. I think that division is unfortunate. Um, but look, look, Austrian economics is not a religion. <laughs> Austrian economics is, is an intellectual uh, tradition. It's an intellectual tradition. I believe that it's a tradition that, hold, that still holds enormously valuable potential. Which doesn't mean to say that a person should be only an Austrian econo economist. It doesn't mean to say a person should not study uh, contributions outside Austrian economics. It means that a person is likely to be able to get richer and deeper understanding by uh, staying within, by, by, by focusing on uh, the insights of the Austrian tradition. Now, what about the future? 
I don't know. In determining the ability of the future. But that's a very important with regard to intellectual movements. To predict intellectual movements is, is it's not just silly, if you may excuse my saying, it's not just silly, it's almost self-contradictory. As Lachman used to say, future knowledge cannot be known in advance. Because if you know it now, there's not future knowledge. So if I could predict what the future would be of Austrian economics, that means I would know it now, in a sense, right? And, and that's not possible. So I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. Uh, I can see a number of possibilities. I can see that it might die out. In other words, that it might become completely <coughs> absorbed again, as it was in 1930, 32, apparently absorbed again. Uh, I think, I've, I've, my whole career, I believe that there is, uh, there is fruitfulness in retaining a purity of an approach, not necessarily contradicting the, the validity of, of other contributions, but retaining the purity of a, of, of, of a set of insights and I think that still holds true. That's my own personal hunch. Okay? Um, the Austrian economics might die out, might die out for, 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 for lack of, for lack of uh, fresh, fresh intellectual uh, discoveries, fresh intellectual contributions. I hope not. It might die out because of being absorbed into the mainstream. It might, uh, it might take over conceivably. I don't believe it. I don't believe that. I think the best interest, best intellectual interest in uh, other approaches is too big. Uh, it might, you know, there are some Austrian economists who believe the future of Austrian economics lies in cooperation with other uh, systems, with other disciplines, uh, with law, uh, with sociology, uh, with philosophy. Okay, uh, I'm not in any way against uh, interdisciplinary work. Uh, some of that may be very fruitful and very interesting and very fascinating. Uh, I would hope, though, that the purely economic contributions of the Austrian traditions would not be lost sight of. Uh, I think one of the great uh, contributions of Austrian economics is that it was able to, to identify very clearly the purely economic aspect of, of, of social life. Uh, uh, Richard Liebling kindly referred to my first book, my doctoral dissertation under Mises. It was Mises who, who of course, gave me the idea for that dissertation because he believed that the identification of the, of the economic element in social life is extremely important. It is, a, it is a scientific contribution to be able to identify the purely economic aspect of social life. So I would hope that wouldn't get lost. I hope that interdisciplinary work, uh, valuable though it may be, would not smudge the, the identification of the purely economic. In other words, there are chains of causation which are not sociological, which are not uh, philosophical, which are not physical, which are purely economic. Those purely economic chains, I think, can be illuminated by Austrian understanding. I believe so. Thank you very much.